I'm so honored uh, now to present uh, my friend, uh, Bishop William Barber, and we have him on live feed, right? So let's put him up. So, William, welcome. Do you hear me well? I just want to get a little taste to make sure that um, I'm coming through. If they have a way of acknowledging that, I don't know in the chat or all these different ways, just to make sure everything looks well on my end. Give me just one moment. Give me a second. Does the chat say you can hear me? Great, 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 great. I see great. So that must mean you can hear me. Well, let me thank you so much, Rick, for uh, all that you and Sharon represent for your great work at the Historical Society. And I want to be the first, uh, maybe not the first, but one of them, I want to pledge $1,000 this year uh, to the fund that was just announced uh, in your honor. And uh, I just want to get that information. You send back what I need through my bishop and regional minister, uh, Valerie Melvin, my dear sister, and we'll get that in the mail. Uh, A-S-A-P, A-S-A-P, uh, to you. Gracious and eternal God, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your kindness. Give us strength in this moment to say what you would have us to say and then to do what you would have us to do. We know whenever you call men and women to preach, teach, you take the risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. So hide us behind the cross, cover us in your blood, fill us with your spirit and power us through your love. For we ask it in Jesus' name and believe it done. Amen. You know, Rick, um, I've been thinking about this thing. We must meet this moment in history. And I was reading Amos chapter 5, beginning around the uh, ninth verse, I think. And I want to read it to you in the Message Bible, you being a good Old Testament scholar. It says, people hate this kind of talk. Raw truth is never popular. But here it is, bluntly spoken. Because you run roughshod over the poor and take bread right out of their mouths, you're not going to move into the luxury homes you have built. You're never going to drink wine from the expensive vineyards you've planted. I know precisely the extent of your violations and the enormity of your sins. And it is indeed appalling, to say the least, as a nation. You bully right living people. You take bribes both on the right and the left and you kick the poor when they're down. Verse 13, justice to some seems like a lost cause. Evil is epidemic. Decent people are throwing up their hands. Protest and rebuke seem to be useless on you and a waste of breath. Seek good and not evil and live. You talk about the God of the angel arm as being your friend. Well, live like it and maybe that will happen. Hate evil and love good, then work it out in the public square. Maybe then the God of the God of the angel armies will notice your remnant and be gracious if you will work it out in the public square. Now again, God of the angel army says, I need you to go out and meet in the streets and lament and cry loudly. I need a remnant to fill the malls and the shops with the cries of doom and weep and declare, not me, not us, not on our watch, not now. I need you to empty the offices, the stores, the factories, the workplaces. I need you to enlist everybody in a general lament. I want to hear you cry loudly. I want to hear you make clear how bad it is. And then when I hear you crying, I will make my visit. 
we must meet this moment in history. I want you to hold that scripture for a moment. I want to come back to it. I want to do a little reading of history and then come back to the text. Because when I did exegetical work some 30 years ago in seminary, I was always taught by one of my professors to study the Zitzenleben, the setting of the text, the setting around the text in order to understand the text. You know, history is, is in large part made by the choices we make. History doesn't just happen to us. History happens because of us. And history is a curious thing. If the hunter, Africans say, tell the story, then the lion is always the evil one. Charles Long used to say, great philosopher and professor of religion, he said, if you're in the slave ship and you're praying in the bottom of the ship as a slave, or you're praying on the top of the ship as a slave master, who are you praying to? Which God are you praying to? And are you asking the same thing of God? Because history is a curious thing. Just a few days ago, I was walking a leg of the route on Highway 81 in Selma, from Selma to Montgomery, where Jew, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and others, even people not of faith, walked over 51 miles from Selma to Montgomery. At that time, in 1965, it was called the most dangerous 51 miles a black person could walk. They made a choice in that moment. They made a choice that was rooted in a whole lot of choices because the march from Selma to Montgomery actually began in the 1930s uh, with efforts in Selma. And the 1965 march, the first mass meeting was in 1963, May of 1963, even before the, 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 mass, the march on Washington. There was organizing going on in Selma by Amelia Boyington when her husband died. And they had a mass meeting in his honor to talk about what they would fight for because Amelia had been fighting 40 years by that time already for the right to vote. And they called a mass meeting and there were more police in the church, Tabernacle Baptist Church, surrounding the walls with guns during the mass meeting than there were people in the mass meeting. We often don't talk about that. We talk about John Lewis and what happened in 65, but long before 65 people were making choices. History is made in large part by choices we make. History doesn't just happen to us, but because of us. And as I was walking on those miles the other day with a group of young people and older people and clergy, I could not help but think about the choices people made to change history president in that season had said he wasn't going to be bothered with voting rights. Voting rights had been cut out of the 64 Civil Rights Act. The president himself was a former segregationist. He had decided that he would work on poverty, but not deal anymore with the race issue, but the people in Selma. And Selma was a place where people were told as activists, you go to Selma to be forgotten. Nothing good will ever come out of Selma small town away from the major cities of Birmingham and Montgomery. And yet, Selma is where history was changed. Selma is where in some ways America had another rebirth. They walked from a church, a small AME church. They were beaten and came back to a church and the church pews became hospital beds. They were beaten on a Sunday, a Sunday right in the middle of the season of Lent and the season of Easter. But they acted and they made a choice because history doesn't just happen to us, but because of us. Two Unitarians and one Christian were killed as martyrs in that movement. By Ulawusa, a Unitarian from Detroit. James Reeb, Reverend James Reeb, a Unitarian from Washington, D.C. 
and Jimmy Lee Jackson, a Christian young man who had just come back from the war. It was his death actually that was from which the idea of a march first arose. Because the original march was, it was going to be to take his body in his casket, walk it all the way to um, uh, Montgomery and to declare that he was the result of racism and injustice. Almost all the people, or his death was the result and things needed to change. Almost all of the people beaten on the bridge were Christian because they knew that history in large part is made by the choices we make. History doesn't just happen to us, but because of us. Now, sadly, the people that beat them, Jim Clark, the sheriff, the other deputies, they claim to be Christian too. They've been impacted by racism. And racism is a religion to some degree. And wherever it touches, wherever it touches, it distorts and destroys and diminishes. After they were beaten, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King sent out an email to religious leaders, and they came. Rabbi Heschel, the Jewish rabbi, the bishop of the Orthodox Church in full regalia came. Even some nuns broke with their bishop's order not to go to Selma. And there's this great picture showing the Unitarians, the nuns, the Christians, and others, the Jews, Jewish people, all walking together because they knew that history doesn't just happen to us, but because of us. They knew, as I was walking the other day and thinking, that they had to meet their moment in history. In this experiment we call America, the church has had a curious history in how she has met her moment in the 1600s when there was a decision made that we needed a system of racism and there was a need for slavery. You know, race, as the one kid, Dr. Kennedy says, is not the, the, the father of racism, but race is the child of racism. The idea of racism, the idea of separate, separating people for economic benefit comes first and then the decision to do it by racial delineation the delineation comes second at that time when there was this decisions about where America would be as it relates to slavery the church had to make a choice in history some of the church following the distorted reality and the lies of racism chose to say that when you were baptized, well, first there was even a question about whether or not you could baptize a slave. Then there was a decision if you baptized a slave, it was supposed to make the slave more docile and the slave had to swear an oath upon being baptized that they would in no way use their baptism as a means or justification for their freedom. But others in the church said no, that it was the antithesis of the faith to be racist and to have slaves, and that the slave was not a slave, but a human brother or sister, and that the baptism into Christ was a baptism into the very fight against slavery. In fact, there was a time in the, one of the Great Awakenings in the early evangelical movement that when you confessed Christ at the same time, you had to renounce slavery and racism in order to hold a true confession of faith. In the 19, 1840s and 50s, the church was called again to meet history. The question of abolition of slavery 
was, 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 was through and through throughout the nation. And many people don't talk about the fact, we talk about the Civil War in the nation in 1861, but around 1848, 49, and 50, there was a civil war in the church before there ever was a civil war in the nation. And perhaps if the church had met history in a unified way against slavery, there would have never been a civil war. Never been the thousands and thousands that died. But the part of the church decided that they would stand with slavery. The other part said no, and so the church split. Southern Baptists, Northern Baptists, Southern Methodists, Northern Methodists. Our history as disciples even is curious in that regard. We make history by how we meet history. Some of the church failed miserably, choosing to consecrate slavery, while others chose to challenge slavery. But it was a civil war in the church that fostered the civil war that later came to the nation. In the 1850s, Frederick Douglass did a speech <clears throat> entitled the American Negro, American Slave, and, and this 4th of July. And he declared that he hated the religion of the slave. Now, he had to, but he loved the religion, the Christianity, the faith of Jesus Christ. And to love the faith of Jesus Christ necessitated a hatred of the religion of the slave master. Slavery comes, and then there is, I mean, the Civil War, and then there's a attempt to reconstruct uh, the, the, the country during the time between 1865 and the 1870s, 1880s. Some clergy people, like for instance, Bishop J.W. Hood in North Carolina were on the side of rewriting Southern constitutions all over the country. They got greatly involved Others were involved in how to stop the forward progress, how to take the, 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 the country backwards. And some churches saw themselves as being the, the holding ground for what they called God's way, which was the way of racism. 1877, there's an election in the country a man by the name of Rutherford B. Hayes gets selected president. He loses the popular vote. He wins the electoral college by making a deal that if he is selected, he would pull the troops out of the South. And when he pulled the troops out of the South, he would turn the South back over to the forces of racism and Jim Crow. He gets put in as president. He does exactly what he says. Some of the church goes along with it and rejoices in what he does. Other parts of the church meet history by challenging what he does. The church I pastor, the reason I talk about this history, was founded in 1886. 1886. The church I pastor, Greenlee Christian Church, First Greenlee Church of Christ, is a congregation that is a result of how the church met history. In my father's book on disciple assemblies, he pointed out that the politics of deconstruction that were led by Rutherford B. Hayes and other forces, violent forces, the politics of retrogression, created a lot of distrust among many black disciples and white disciples. And so in North Carolina, for instance, black disciples felt a need to separate for survival, and many, some white congregations wanted the separation. And so even today, we have ecle ecclesiological realities. We have structures that trace ba back to how the church chose to meet history. Where our pastor, Valerie Melvin Bishop, knows this history well. Her father was once bishop of the Goldsboro Raleigh Assembly. The building that the Goldsboro Raleigh Assembly sits in in Eastern North Carolina, or what used to sit in before it was torn down and it was a new building right there. But on that land, that original building was designed to be a college. The former pastor of the church I pastor, C.R.D. Whitfield, who 
had seven sons to be preachers. One of them pastored Loudoun Avenue Christian Church in, in Roanoke, Virginia, but C.R.D. Whitfield became the general, uh, uh, we would call it bishop today. Uh, he was a general elder back then, uh, uh, presiding elder, if you will. Uh, um, uh, he, he, he helped to build that facility because black brothers and sisters were not allowed entry into Barton College. And so the goal was that the Goldsboro Institute would be a college, a Christian college for African-American ministers and students. We make history by how we choose to meet history. In the 1900s, the church had another choice, the industrialism and corporate greed and monopolism was flourishing in this country. Uh, there was all kind of battles in industrialism, but one of the battles was how to get the most out of people, the cheapest. And in doing so, there were no child labor laws. There were no uh, workday laws. There were no uh, hourly wage laws. In many parts of the country, children walked around with two and three fingers cut off. Men were, men were forced to work in in facilities that had little if any ventilation, were dying young. And the social gospel movement had to make a decision to meet history. Do we be quiet or do we say something? And people like Walter Rauschenbusch and others decided to meet history by asking the question, what would Jesus do? And the social gospel movement decided to take on what was happening, the greed and the industrialism and the problems. And out of that movement produced Frances Perkins, who became the first female labor secretary who served under President Roosevelt, who really was the architect in many ways of the New Deal. So because the church met history, uh, Frances Perkins was produced a theology of challenging the greed of society was in place. In fact, it was the, the teachings of Walter Rauschenbusch from the early 1900s as he taught from Hale's Kitchen in New York that actually greatly influenced the later thinking of Martin Luther King in terms of economics and what a Christian witness of economic justice ought to look like. We, 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 we make history by how we meet history. But then in the, in the 1930s and 40s, as I said, curious is a history, uh, history is a, a curious thing. You had some clergy like Harry Emerson Fosdick that were writing hymns in the church and singing songs like this in the church. The one I love is um, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. And it says, cure your children's warring madness, bend our pride to your control, shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul, Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss your kingdom's goal, lest we miss your kingdom's goal. This was the singing and preaching that was happening in church. The church was saying we cannot be on the sidelines when it comes to issues of injustice and greed and hatred. But in that same period of time, in the 1940s and 50s, there was another attempt to use the church to meet history in a different way. Kevin Cruz wrote a book called One Nation Under God, and you ought to read it. He's a Princeton scholar, and he talks about how the idea of a so-called Christian nation was promoted in the 1930s and 40s when the industries, let me read this, when the industrialists and the business lobbies were chafing against the government regulations of the New Deal. They recruited, listen now, they recruited and funded conservative clergy to preach faith, freedom, and free enterprise. In his book, he did the research and footnoted and said there was a conflation of Christianity and capitalism, and it moved to the center stage in the 1950s under Eisenhower. He goes on to say, according to the conventional narrative, the Soviet Union discovered the bomb and the United States rediscovered God. Cruz says, however, in order to push back uh, uh, they, they say in order to push back against the atheistic communism of the Soviet Union, that is the history we're taught, that Americans re-embraced the religious identity. He said that played a small role, but actually it's a longer arc, that the Cold War consensus actually helped to paper over 
a couple, a couple decades of internal political struggles in the United States. And if you look at the architects of this language, the state power that they worried about is not the Soviet Union's power, but the power of the New Deal and the power of the Fair Deal and the power of the government, reigning in the greed of industry. He says in his book, the New Deal had passed a large number of measures that were regulating business in some way for the first time, and it had empowered labor unions and gave them a voice in the affairs of business, and it rooted itself in a moral framework, really much because of the way Francis Perkins approached these issues. And corporate leaders resented both of these moves, so they launched a a massive listen campaign of public relations designed to sell the values of enterprise. The problem was the country wasn't listening to them because of the depression and because the corporate corporate leaders had run the country into the depression. And so largely what the corporations were saying and how they were crying that they were being hurt and was dismissed. And so they did a study. And they did a study to find out who had the moral ear of the country. And the study came back and said the poor pit. And Cruz said, and then these corporate leaders decided, how can we buy the poor pit? How can we own the poor pit? This is what they how they chose to meet this moment in history. How can we control the poor pit? How can we how can we have the poor pit? How can we make Christianity and capitalism soulmate? How can we use the poor pit to tear down the New Deal? So they came up with a strange form of Calvinism, misguided Calvinism. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. If you are capitalist and you work hard, you make a profit. If you don't, it's because you're lazy. And the New Deal, they argued, violated the natural order that God has set in place. They argued the New Deal violated the Ten Commandments. And they hired a guy by the name of Reverend James Fifield. He passed the first Congregationalist Church in Los Angeles. It was an elite church. He ministered to millionaires, and he decided that he was going to debone the gospel, debone the Bible. He was not going to deal with any of the scriptures that had to deal with justice, but only other scriptures that he could easily twist to make worldly success a sign of heavenly blessing. The corporations came together, says Cruz, and decided to fund him heavily fund him. He called it spiritual mobilization. Sun Oil President J. Howard Pugh put in millions of dollars for this. Listen. Alfred Sloan of General Motors put in millions of dollars for this. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce put in millions of dollars for this. If you understand this history, you understand why right now the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is fighting against voter, voting rights and living wages. The National Association of Manufacturers put in millions of dollars. They gave five field millions of dollars. They chose to meet history by de up destroying the gospel witness rather than upholding it. And within 10 years, he had 17,000 pulpits purchased, 17,000 so called minister representatives who belonged to the organization of spiritual mobilization, preaching sermons. In fact, they were so competitive that they actually competed for cash prizes for the best sermons, the sermons that could best denounce the New Deal, denounce social justice, denounce programs that lift the poor, and preach simply what the ultra-capitalists wanted to be preached. And the sermons that won were the ones that called the New Deal and anything like it that, that regulated greed, evil. And the sermons that won, they were re-preached over and over and over again. They chose to meet history that way. And today we see so much of the wrong that is coming out of, came out of that 1950s and 60s in the midst of Jim Crow. Some persons that claim to be church chose to, again, endorse Jim Crow, uphold Jim Crow, embrace the violence, embrace governors saying segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And some chose the way of justice, calling racism sin. The civil rights movement. It's no wonder 
that in even in the 1940s, Richard Niebuhr and Howard Thurman came together and formed uh, an institute of religion that actually had as its goal to teach the, the, the militant love of Jesus Christ as a exegetical framework for unpacking Jim Crow. Actually, it was a collaboration between Howard University uh, 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 and uh, Yale University in some ways. There's some history more and more. We're finding out about this. I could go on. I could go on and on because history is curious. But the point is, the church can't avoid meeting history. And the church has to be careful how we meet history because history doesn't just happen. History happens because of how we meet history. And we bear a responsibility for how we meet history. I believe that right now we are in a history meeting moment. We are in a history meeting moment. And what we do right now is going to have an impact for the next 50 years or more. In fact, it may be the future of this democracy and even the world hinges on the decision that the church makes right now in the midst of history. Why do I say that? <clears throat> The reality of poverty in this moment, in the midst of so much wealth, along with the five interlocking injustices of racism, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism, threaten the future of the democracy. Not the future of the Republican Party, the future of the Democrat Party, but the literal future of the democracy. And how we in the church meet this moment of history is of utmost importance. Recently, I was teaching again at the Vatican and the invitation of the Pope to be a member of the Pontifical Academy. And the Pope said, today we see that the world has never been so rich. And yet, despite such abundance, poverty and inequality persist and grow in these times of opulence when it should be possible to put an end to poverty, the power of one-track thinking say nothing of the poor, the elderly, the migrants, the unborn, and the seriously ill, mostly invisible, they are treated as disposable. He went on to say that the trickle-down economics and neoliberalism are magical formulas of evil that actually continue to keep poverty alive in a time that it could be solved and threaten the very history and the future of the world itself. A Pew study just came out not too long ago and it studied 50,000 sermons, 50,000 sermons. They wanted to know what do people hear in pews and churches? We know and it knew that over, there are over 2,000 scriptures in the Bible about how we treat the least of these and the poor and the church's responsibility to speak to those issues. Jesus started his first sermon, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. That word that poor translated is in, in, from Greek is, is those who are made poor by systems of economic exploitation. At the end of them, he said that, that we, the nations, nations, governments would be judged by how we treat the poor. So this study was done knowing that the only other sin listed more than how we treat the treatment of the poor and, and, and the least of these is that of idolatry and self-worship. Over 2,000 scriptures according to the Poverty and Justice Bible. And yet, the word poverty did not even register among what is preached among those 50,000. Understand, they did a percentage point, so how often did hallelujah register how often was grace said how often was communion said and the poor did not even read not one percent of the time in american pulpits even though we're in a time where the oxfam group just released a report um just ahead of the world economic forum and the report is titled in inequality kills and they say at least 21,000 people die each day from poverty and inequality every four seconds. 
every four seconds. Meanwhile, a new billionaire is created every 26 hours. That report just came out. And right here in America, right here in America, we know that 250,000 people die every, every year from poverty. This, this, is, this is before we ever had to deal with COVID death. And we're almost at a million now. This is before we ever had to deal with COVID deaths. 700 people a day almost three people every hour die from poverty. Now listen again to Amos and the exaltation of the prophet in the sixth century. He says, God says, I need a remnant that will go out and meet in the street and lament loudly, fill the malls and the shops with the cries of doom, Weep loudly, empty the offices, the factories, the workplaces. Get everybody involved in the lament. I want to hear it loud. And then I'll come see about you. Early on, what did he say? Amos said in this fifth chapter, justice is a lost cause, some are saying. Evil is epidemic. Decent people are throwing up their hands. Too many people are being bullied. We're taking bribes on the right and the left. The only way to fix it, says Amos, says God to Amos, is for God's people to meet, to meet in the street, to meet history. Now, we often take from Amos chapter 5, that 21st to the 24th verse, where it says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. What I want is for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. God was actually saying the wrong way to meet history in a moment of grave injustice is to just stay inside of our quarantine conventions, our quarantine sacred meetings, and say nothing of what's going on. But the right way to meet history in a moment of gross injustice and grotesque greed and pornographic sums of money being, being swept up to the those who don't need it is to meet in the street. That's what God said, six cent, said in the sixth century BC. And that tells me from the scripture that as the church, we are called to shift the moral narrative. We must, that's how, that's how we must meet history. We're called to put a face on the pain of our people and to, and to put a face on the injustice and to call the nation to repentance, to, if you will, break the nation's heart that give it the possibility to, to change, to break up the fallow ground, to break up the stony heart. We've got, and we've got serious moral work to do in this moment. I took you through those other places of history because the church, as I said, had a curious way. Sometimes the church has made the right, right, right decision. Sometimes it hasn't. But in this moment, We've got to decide how we're going to meet it. We can't ignore it. When the Congress can unanimously condemn what Putin is doing in Ukraine and should, but then remain so divided over addressing the issues right here in our own country, we've got to decide how we're going to meet this moment. We must challenge the lies of scarcity and the notion that this is the best we can do. America, for instance, is going to claim to be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, then we cannot ignore the data. If we're going to be true to, that our calling is to establish justice and to promote the general welfare, yes, general welfare of all people, then we've got to deal with the church has to find its voice, not the voice of politics, but the voice of the church, the moral voice, Where's and our, our space in demanding that the nation must guarantee living wages and adequate income and health care and affordable housing and quality and public education and expanding and protecting voting rights and fair taxation and debt relief and just immigration and climate justice. Amos, God said, Amos, I need a remnant that will meet history by, by meeting in the street and calling the nation to a lament. 
a deep crying over her injustices. The church can't meet this moment. Disciples can't meet this moment, especially those of us who claim to be people of the table and we welcome all to the table. That table theology must have deep, but also must guide us in our social justice critique. We must bring people together to lament. We're called to be a prophetic challenge. Uh, all of our faith traditions, almost all of them, require us to confront injustice through sustained moral action, not just through a litany, not just through a moment of prayer, but we got to work it out in the public square, as God told Amos. A remnant has to meet in the streets, shut down the factories and the schools and all that is, because God says, only then will I visit, only then can I come, only then will I help you. But if you do it, I will help you. We can't be silent anymore. We must compel the nation to mourn and feel the pain and the power, pain of our people and see that the path of healing, the path of justice is possible. Because uh, if we don't meet this moment right, the entire civilization, democracy is in trouble. We must move this society beyond these false, puny, weak discussions of liberal versus conservative and right versus left and toward this essential question of right versus wrong. We must not only revive the heart of the nation, in some ways, the nation needs a new heart, a heart transplant. We must have a moral meeting to address these interlocking injustices and understand that there is an interlockingness, an interlocking evil to systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, uh, militarism, the war economy, and this false moral narrative of religious nationalism. We can't be in our silos anymore. We can't even talk about racism as a silo issue. It's not just racism toward black people. For instance, voter suppression today is not just something hurting black people, it's hurting all people. If the laws that get put in place now that people are proposing, 50,000 Americans will lose access to the polls, not 50,000 black people, excuse me, 50 million Americans will lose access to the polls they had in 2020. They won't have them in 2022. The racism toward indigenous people and what's happening on reservation and racism is happening toward immigrants from, from either from, from Mexico or from Haiti. The collateral damage of racism, and what it does to our white brothers and sisters. You know, Dr. King said in 1965, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, he said that it was the fear of the coming together of the masses of black people and the masses of poor white people coming together by the Southern aristocracy that was the backbone and the backdrop of, of, of segregation and voter suppression. It was the fear of people coming together to address poverty and creating the beloved community that was at the root of voter suppression and segregation. We have to have a moral meeting. We've got to have a meeting. We must meet history because our politics are trapped right now in the lie of scarcity that we don't have enough, which is the biggest lie there ever was. Or it's lacked, or, or we're trapped in trickle-down economics. If you just give a little bit to the top of the trickle-down, or neoliberalism, if you just help the middle class. Think about the last time you've even heard in a presidential or senatorial debate, the, 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 a mention of the poor, a mention of the poor, a mention of poverty. Instead, what we have is the politics of turning people against each other, blaming the poor for their poverty. Even though we live in a country, when we talk about scarcity, a $21 trillion gross domestic product. If, and, and if we just took $3 trillion, $4 trillion dollars and, and over the next 10 years and put it toward things that would lift the poor out of poverty, particularly out of the poverty that's been exacerbated uh, since COVID, it would barely be, it would barely be, uh, uh, it wouldn't even be a tenth hardly of our entire gross domestic product of over $21 trillion. We must have a meeting, we must meet this moment in history with a prophetic witness because right now, even before COVID, there are 140 million poor and low wealth people 
in this country. I want you to think about that, 140 million. That's 43% of the nation is poor and low wealth right now before COVID ever hit. 52% of our children are poor and low wealth in America right now. We watched billionaires make $2 trillion since COVID hit, while 8 million more people fell into poverty. Right now, as we are on this live stream, as you sit there, there are 87 million people in this country who are either uninsured or underinsured. There are people dying in our pews, and when we as preachers stand over them and say, the Lord called them home, sometimes we're actually lying because God didn't call them home. They were killed by a concept developed in the 18th century called social murder, when policies neglect people to the point where they can no longer live. Millions of people are homeless or near homeless. Most of the people that died in the pandemic, we have a major study coming out in a few weeks that most of the people that died in the pandemic were poor and low wealth. They were the first to force to go to work, the first to get sick, the first to die. But but the vet, my daughter's a, a, a PhD in public health, and she said, Daddy, the, the statistics that they're not telling, they're not keeping, is what happened to poor and low wealth people during the pandemic. It's almost as though somebody doesn't want us to know that the bulk of the pain of the pandemic, the bulk of the people who have died, nearly a million now, the fact that 60% of them didn't have to die according to Columbia University, but, but, but the bulk that died were poor and low wealth people. And maybe that's some of the reasons why certain forces feel like they don't have to provide this or provide that because really the pandemic primarily killed the poor who were already dying at a rate of a quarter million a, a year and 700 a day. These realities, you know, this reality is the breeding ground for autocratic leaders. When you got 140 million people living in poverty, 66 million are white, 26 million are black, 68% of Latinos, 68% of indigenous people. When you have that kind of thing going on, it is in fact the breeding ground, the very breeding ground for autocratic leadership. It is the kind of breeding ground that people who can come in and play on people's fears and play on their hurt and we've got to decide as the church how we meet this moment of history. The debt, what the pandemic has done is reveal deep fissures in our society and it's exposed long-term racial and economic inequality. It's like a, like a contrast die. Like a contrast die. And you think about it, we've almost had a million people die from COVID. And we haven't had a week of mourning as a nation. I want to think about that for a minute. Thousands of people dying in Ukraine, million people dying from COVID, quarter million people dying from poverty. And we've not just stopped. People are more worried about getting back to normal than mourning. We must have a meeting because we're living in historic times and time when we have less voting rights today than we had in 1965 and an all out assault on voting rights. We must have a meeting, a moral meeting, and meet this moment because we spent $21 trillion in war since the Iraq war. Right now, we spend 54 cents of every discretionary dollar in the war economy, before what broke out in Ukraine, and less than 16 cents of every discretionary dollar on health care and living wages and education, the things that actually build a society. And Dr. King said, whenever your military budget drives every decision of a society, that decision is on a spiral. That, that nation is on a spiral toward death. None of this has to be. I was recently, as I closed in the UN, and I was talking to the special rapporteur for poverty, and he came up to me and said, Bishop, he said, I'm not a religious person. I don't necessarily believe in God. He said, but I know some things, and I want to share them with you. He said, we don't have a lack of resources in the world. The resources are there to end poverty and low wealth tomorrow. End it. 
And then, and he said, I'm not talking about socialism. Not, we can end it just by doing fair things. He said, we don't have a lack of ideas. He said, what we have is a lack of moral consciousness. And then he said something to me. As a person who said he wasn't a believer, he says, and I know a God-sized problem when I see one. I may not be a person of faith, but I know what you're supposed to be doing. I know what those of you of people of faith should be doing because conscience is your work. Shaping moral consciousness is your work. Causing people to repent and lament is your work. He said, and if the church, those of you people of faith don't help us, he says, I fear for where we're headed as a society. We shared our budget in other work with the Institute for Economic Policy, Economic Policy Institute. And they looked at it and they said, the things we were talking about doing were, were, but if the nation did not do them, it was morally indefensible, constitutionally inconsistent, politically insensitive, and economically insane. Right now, we lose, for instance, a trillion dollars a year from just allowing child poverty to exist. And we know that that's just 2% of our national budget going toward programs that work could eradicate 70% of poverty. Amos said through, God said through Amos years ago that in history, God's people must meet history. It's not always the majority. God said, if I can just get a remnant, I can just get a remnant to have the right kind of meeting in the public square, cause the right kind of tears, the right kind of lament, then we can change the nation. We can cause justice to roll down like waters, righteousness like a mighty stream. And I, for one, want to take God at God's word. And it's time for us to meet this moment. Sometimes we might have to meet it like God told Ezekiel. You meet it, and even if they don't listen, at least they will know that there have been a prophet among you, but you cannot back away from this moment. We must meet this moment in the public square. We must call this nation to lament. We must say, not now, not on our watch. We must have, and that's why we're calling for a mass poor people's low wage workers assembly, moral march on Washington to the polls, June 18, 2022. And we're asking all disciples and all people to come and let's have a meeting. Let's have a meeting where we call this nation to repentance. Let's have a meeting where we put poor and low wealth people and their voices uh, before the nation because it's not them, it's all of us. Our very society is at stake. The very, the very civilization. You cannot exist. You, if you think, you know, the insurrection happened on January 6th, Epiphany, and they said most of the people in that insurrection were upper middle class and wealthy people who had been beguiled by racism and white supremacy and, and Trumpism. But Epiphany is a time when you open your eyes, and, and maybe what we need to see in the insurrection is that if that can happen, to know what will happen if 140 million people lose hope, if folk from Appalachia to Alabama start feeling like there's, that nobody is going to even try to address this issue of poverty, what happens if we get to over 50% of people in poverty in the midst of so much wealth? Could the insurrection on January 6th just be a tip of the iceberg? I think so. And if that is the call, we need a resurrection of moral focus, of moral move. We need to follow Amos's model. We need a Pentecost, a moral Pentecost. We must meet this moment. We must meet it with a remnant in the street. Saying not now, not on our watch. We must meet it in a way that guarantees that God will visit us and give our efforts strength and power. What we cannot do is stay asleep in the midst of this moment of history. What we cannot do is choose to be quiet and let injustice just reign. And surely what we cannot do is choose in our churches to preach the same thing that the corporate world preaches and never even mention the poor. What we cannot do is stay away. What we cannot do is just wait on heaven in the by and by. God told Amos, when 
injustice is at pandemic levels. I need a remnant that will work it out in the public. I need a remnant that will meet history head on, face it, look at it, expose it, offer it a way out, lament about it, offer new possibilities. And hadn't God always used meetings? In the beginning book of creation, the Bible doesn't say the Lord said, let me, it said, let us make man. When God decided to make human, he called a meeting. In the book of Ezekiel, God called a meeting, the Valley of Dry Bones. He looked for a person that could stand in the gap. Ezekiel 22 could not find anybody. But in Ezekiel 37, God said, I know where the hope of Israel lies. It's in the Valley of Dry Bones. I need you as a prophet to go there and speak and let the word get in them and then my spirit get on them and I'll strengthen them and they will become hope. God had a meeting in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it changed the heart of a king when they came out, and they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them, and the king looked at them and said, I thought we put three in there, but what's this fourth one in the meeting? David had a meeting in the valley. He, he met with five rocks, not one, for battle against Goliath. Pentecost was a meeting. And one of the first things that happened after the meeting on Pentecost is they set up a way of living that no one would have any need. There was a meeting even in Calvary, on Calvary, because it says when Jesus gave up the ghost that the, the prophets of old got up out of the graves. Almost kind of like a dual resurrection. One of the prophets getting up that day and then Jesus getting up later. There's a meeting. That meeting, God has always used these moral meetings People coming together. Abolitionists was a meeting. Women's suffrage movement, Seneca Falls, meeting. Civil rights movement, Jewish Muslim law, Jewish Christian lawyers coming together, black and white, having these meetings. Selma was a meeting. Montgomery was a meeting. Birmingham was a meeting. Greensboro uh, uh, lunch counter was a meeting. Mar the watch on Washington was a meeting. God always has a remnant that will come together and meet history meet history not just let it happen but meet it and whenever god has fundamentally changed the course of history and changed the heart of the nation he's always used a meeting just like god said to amos i need a remnant i need a remnant who will go in the street meet in the streets cry loudly act as though something is wrong weep well put a face on the pain Show the nation what's wrong. And when you do that, I'll visit you. I'll help you. I will meet you and give you strength to change history. I hope you'll join at the meeting on June 18th. We've got more power than we realize, but we can't stay inside. God says, I, I don't need in this moment more of your internal conventions. I need a meeting. I need a meeting in the street. I need a remnant to know God is not finished with this nation or this world yet. I need a meeting of people who understand that you have to say something. If you're going to be a Christian witness, you have to meet history. You cannot just let it happen. Let's have a meeting and change the course of this world for the betterment. God bless you. Thank you so much for this time.